Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and a pleasure to welcome you all. So on behalf of the, the School of History, um, I would like to welcome you all to, to this memorial event, physically present as well as virtually for the first time since the pandemic. Um, it's a great pleasure to see so many people here. would like to extend a special welcome to Jennifer's friends who have come from long distances from England and elsewhere to this event, and to Tom O'Reilly, Jennifer's son, representing his family here, and to Professor Terry O'Reilly, who is joining us virtually. Um, it, it's wonderful to have so many, many of you here. Um, I'd like to note that this series is made possible by the generosity of the School of History, and I'd like to thank our new head of school, Hiram Morgan, for continuing that practice, and there will be a reception afterwards where we can all relax. Um, my thanks also to the organising committee, and to, to Tom O'Reilly, to Dr Maureen McCarran, and to Dr Malcolm Zata Dalton. And uh, also a huge thank you to Tom and to Maureen for their work on giving permanence to the lectures and um, in the form of beautifully produced books that Jennifer would have absolutely delighted in. And Jennifer would also be delighting in the topic of today's presentation and in the person who's giving it. So Dovio Cronin is an extraordinarily distinguished scholar and a very generous mentor like Jennifer to the rising generation. Lectured in at NUI Galway. He was a founding member of the Medieval Academy of Ireland and with Maureen today is uh, co-editing. His work on Hiberno-Latin literature, texts on insular culture, on Ireland's place within the broader European world um, um, is extraordinary. And his work on computistics and on the Easter controversy alone is foundational. And that is something that Jennifer was fascinated by, as, as we all know. Um, and before I uh, introduce or step back to allow Professor O'Connor to speak, I would have to I'd be failing in my duty as a court person if I didn't do what court people do, which is to find some kind of link. You know, where <laughs> are your people from here? You know? And uh, Professor O'Connor's paternal grandmother was the famous Shalnos traditional singer and Elizabeth S. Cronin from Balavorni in West Cork. And Dovi has not only contributed um, to our understanding of medieval history, but has made a huge contribution to modern cultural history and honouring his grandmother's memory um, by the wonderful edition um, of her sons from 2000 and then I think reissued in 2021. So now we've got you placed. <laughs> it is a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Dovio Cronin, speaking about Pater Egbert of Rathmelsby, the hero of Bede's story Ecclesiastica, question mark. Thank you. Indeed, Robert, for that kind of introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see you all here uh, live. Uh, it's a pleasure to say hello to all of those who are tuning in online. I would like to send special greetings to all the people that uh, Dermot mentioned, particularly Terry, um, but also Lawrence Neese, Larry Neese, who's out in Colorado and who couldn't be here uh, and who would love to be here. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here on this occasion, uh, having been invited to give this particular lecture. Um, it brought me down memory lane, I suppose you could say. Don't worry, by the way, I'm not going to sing. My singing, <laughs> my singing is banned by the Geneva Convention, so whatever happens, uh, there, there's hope for you. Um, this brings me down, as I say, memory lane, because it reminded me of when I first actually met Jennifer, when we are commemorating on this occasion. I was reminded that Jennifer's interest in all this kind of material goes back all the way. Um, so it's not the fact that I'm banging away on the same old drum, Rathmetrica, Rathmetrica, Willowbroad, Willowbroad, Etchbert, Etchbert. Um, I chose this topic specifically because it did remind me of Jennifer's connection with all this kind of material. Um, my title uh, has a question mark, uh, not because I'm doubtful about the proposition, but because I think some other people might be. <laughs> Pater Edgbert of Graz Melchige, um, and the hero of Bede's Historia Ecclesiastica obviously raises various questions. I mean, obviously one initial question would be, are we being anachronistic? Are there heroes that can be celebrated in this period? Is it possible that somebody like uh, Edgbert could be a hero? of somebody like Bede and in something like a Historia Ecclesiastica. 
Um, but I'm reminded of uh, Alcuin, uh, the famous 9th century Northumbrian scholar who was actually related in an interesting way to some of the characters that I'll be talking about uh, in the next half hour or so. Um, Alcuin, in that famous letter that you all know, or many of you will be able to recite almost verbatim, Alcuin reprimanded the monks of Lindisfarne for spending too much time reading the pagan classics, so to speak. Now, by that he meant the Anglo-Saxon or Germanic pagan classics, uh, not the Latin or Greek ones. Um, quid ingeld cum Christo is the famous phrase that he used. What, what does ingeld, well, it's usually translated as what does ingeld have to do with Christ? Ingeld being the great heroic figure of Germanic uh, uh, legendary literature. Uh, and Christ, of course, being the, the hero figure of Christianity. I prefer to translate it as um, what does in, what is Ingeld compared to Christ? And I think the comparison is between Ingeld as a hero in the Germanic tradition compared to Christ, who is the hero figure in the Christian tradition. So from that point of view, I think I'm not being altogether anachronistic in putting the hero into the title of this talk and assuming that something like that would have been understood by Bede and his readers. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Bede, there are such people. Um, Bede is the famous historian, the famous 8th century historian of Anglo-Saxon England, very often regarded in the Historia Classica Gentis Anglorum, um, very often regarded as the premier history, premier narrative history of the early Middle Ages, which has wonderful, wonderful things to say. But in this case, we are talking about the Gens Anglorum, the, the race of the English people. Um, and this is one of the um, surviving copies of Bede's Historia Ecclesiastica, in this case from the British Library, which is interesting for all kinds of reasons. There are, I think, three, arguably four manuscripts of the Historia that have survived, which are almost contemporary with the great man himself. The history is supposed to have been published in 731. Bede himself died in 735. So there or thereabouts uh, are the dates that we're looking at. And there are three, certainly maybe four manuscripts that have survived, which could possibly be argued to be uh, almost contemporary with the great man himself. This one is particularly interesting for its decoration, for its script. I don't have time to talk about the script. I'd love to talk to you about the script. But in this case, we're talking about an insular script, in this case, an Anglo-Saxon insular form of script. And you will notice straight away the decoration, the very elaborate decoration in the initial letter, the opening part of the text. Um, very Irish, some people might have said, and perhaps evidence for Irish influence on the Anglo-Saxons in the course of the seventh and, and subsequent centuries, but that's a matter for debate, and we can discuss that on some other occasion. Bede's own monastery, Jarrow, Wearmouth Jarrow, an interesting uh, foundation, although I have to be careful because there are people in the audience and certainly people online who know a great deal more about Bede and who know a great deal more about his monasteries than I do, um, and I'm very careful of that. But in this case, Jarrow, here presented, um, looking down over what I believe is the largest car park in Western Europe, <laughs> uh, which is not its claim to fame or not its principal claim to fame, but the right-hand side, so to speak, is, I believe, I'm correct in saying, the, the remaining part, the surviving part of the church as it existed in Bede's time. It's in Northumbria, I'll show you a map or two in a moment to give you your, your bearings and so on and a context. But Jarrow, Wearmouth Jarrow, as it's often referred to, is the monastery indelibly associated with Bede and the Historia Ecclesiastica is obviously uh, the most important product of that church. Now, within the, that church that I showed you a moment ago, within the old church, there still survives what we would call a dedication stone, a remarkable document in a whole variety of different ways. Dedicatio Basilicae Sancti Pauli on the um, ninth calends of May, Anno Quinto Decimo Ech Fridi Regis. So this commemorates the opening ceremony, the, the, the cutting of the ribbon, as it were. Think of Charlie Hawhey, you know, think of one of these momentous events where somebody important comes along and is invited to, to inaugurate something or to open something. So on this occasion, it appears to be the case that the official opening of this monastery, Jarrow, was attended by the King of Northumbria at the time, as well as by the abbot. The second part of the inscription relates to Caelfrid, who is abbot of the monastery at that time, um, and who is given as uh, being in the fourth year of his abbacy. So the dedication stone gives you a year for the king, the 15th year of his reign, and the fourth year of Abbot Caelfrid. And when you put the two together, then you get the year 685, 23 April, if my memory serves me right, may or may not have been Easter Sunday in that year. I should have checked, but I didn't. I should know. 
Hmm? Given my reputation, I should be able to tell you without reverence <laughs> that this is Easter Sunday or not, but I can't. Um, however, the dedication stone is interesting for that reason, um, as well as for the fact that the script, I mentioned the script of the, um, the British Library copy of the Historia Ecclesiastica as being distinctively Irish or Anglo-Saxon or insular or Celtic or whatever word you want to use. <laughs> this is demonstrably different. This is an imitation of the old Roman classical script, mm -hmm. examples of which would have been very, very prolific and very obvious around the north of England in the post-Roman period and easily enough copied. But it may or may not be a statement uh, on the part of the people who uh, were in charge in Wearmouth Jarrow at the time that this particular dedication stone was produced in this particular script. Um, I'll have occasion to come back to both of the individuals mentioned on the stone before I finish, but in this case, just bear in mind that we're talking about a stone which is uh, a dedication stone which is dated by regnal year and abatial year, not by anno domini or by any other form of reckoning. Now, I have to be careful with that because Maureen, who is our host, um, is the expert on bead and chronology and dating and all this kind of thing. So I must tread very carefully in what I say <laughs> and hope that uh, she'll treat, treat me leniently if I overstep the mark. Now, again, for a bit of background, as I say, um, for those of you who are not altogether familiar with the period or the, the place we're talking about, uh, Northumbria, the north of England, in relation to Scotland, uh, the Kingdom of the Picts and so on, in relation to the Irish in Western Scotland, the Alrieda, in relation to Ireland, mainland Ireland, if we can use that kind of terminology. It's important to bear in mind in all that we're reading, all that we're discussing, all that we're hearing from Bede about the history of the Anglo-Saxons, that his history is not just a, a Historia Ecclesiastica, that it is very much a political history as well, and that for those who are interested in politics rather than the history of the church, there's just as much in Bede's history for them as there is for anybody who's interested in pure sang uh, ecclesiastical history. And I give you here just a rough outline of what we would describe or what has been described as the, the struggle, the military and political struggle for dominance in Northumbria in the early part of the seventh century. I could have taken you back slightly farther, maybe to the Battle of Dechistan, which was fought in the year 603, uh, a momentous occasion for Anglo-Saxon history or English history and for Irish history, because the Battle of Dechistan was an occasion when the then reigning King of Northumbria came to blows with the then reigning King of Scottish Dalriada. Scottish Dalriada to us is Irish, the, the expat Irish kingdom in Western Scotland, which we call the Kingdom of Dalriada. Um, and uh, the Irish army advanced all the way from the west of Scotland, as you see there on the map. If you take Iona, for example, as your bearing point, as your center point, and just think about it for a moment, look how far Iona is from Northumbria. I mean, in a moment, we'll have occasion to think of how close Iona is to everything that's happening in Northumbria and the rest of England. But just in physical terms, in purely physical terms, in terms of the time it might have taken to move from one place to another, to march an army from one point to another. Just think of the, the distance. I haven't measured it, um, but it's a considerable distance from Iona and the west of Scotland all the way over to Northumbria, all the way down to Lindisfarne and the various other places that we'll see on the map shortly. But around 603, the Battle of Dechistan was fought, as I say, between the Scots, almost certainly in alliance with uh, the Kingdom of the Picts and maybe a few small, what we would call petty British kingdoms as well, maybe in a military alliance, with a view to, uh, to doing away with the uh, ever increasing danger of Anglo-Saxon presence in Northumbria. Um, I like to, I, I used to tell my students, I could tell my students, I have to be careful now since we're being beamed and broadcast to the world, but I used to tell my students that there was an occasion in or around 603 when we could have contemplated this island as being called Hibernica Minor and the neighboring island as Hibernica Maior. <laughs> if things had turned out slightly differently at the Battle of Dechistan, um, I'm conscious now that uh, Arsenal were beaten last night by Manchester City, and, and things can happen. 6-1, um, wasn't it? Newcastle beat somebody recently. Uh, you never know, but if, if it happened, if you're into what if history, if the Battle of Dechistan had gone the other way, then we might well be ruling over the larger offshore island uh, and coming back here on holidays to Hibernica. It didn't work out that way. Um, but that didn't mean that the Irish influence in Northumbria or in England generally or in Britain generally was wiped out of the Battle of Dachistan. Far from it. There's all kinds of developments. All of these dates, all of these places, all of these names have a history which I would love to talk to you about, but we don't have time. But just to give you an idea, 
And this is the Iona uh, that I pointed out to a moment ago, Iona famous as the, the Scottish monastery established by uh, Columbilla, Columba in Latin uh, in 563. Bede says 565, by the way. We'll have occasion to, to think about some of Bede's dates from time to time. This is one example. He says Iona was founded in 565. The Irish sources unanimously have the year 563. Um, it's a tiny island. It's off the western coast of Scotland. It's separated from the mainland by, um, I can't think of it now. It's in a Beatles song. Uh, it'll come back to oh. in a moment. Mull, exactly, the island of Mull. Thank you very much. Um, it's only three and a half miles long by one and a half miles wide, but certainly by the end of the sixth century into the seventh century, you could say for a century, roughly speaking, from its foundation up to about a century after its foundation, Iona was the center point of all the churches in these islands, and that's no exaggeration. I'm including Canterbury, I'm including York, I'm including Wearmouth Jarrow, I'm including a lot of other places. Uh, an amazing amount of the literature that has come down to us from the early Middle Ages in the Irish context, both in the Latin language, for which Iona was justly famous, for reasons I'll come to in a moment, but also in the native vernacular language, an amazing amount of that material can be traced back to Iona. It is the, the centre point, it's the engine room of cultural activity in these islands in the, uh, the late 6th century and into the 7th century. You are going to see, by the way, some of my holiday slides. Okay, This is something you have to put up with. This is what Iona looks like now. This is the restored abbey. Um, there's a religious community there uh, again these days, and, and religious ceremonies are celebrated. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful site, which I would recommend to anybody who hasn't been there. Um, I used to tell my students also, I tell my students a lot, mm -hmm. um, uh, I used to say to them that I was utterly godless. Um, I'm not a Christian. I haven't been a Christian since I was in short pants. Um, I haven't uh, any affiliation with uh, organized religion and so on. But even somebody who is not religious um, could not stand on Iona and not feel something extraordinary about the place. It is a very spiritual place. Uh, not necessarily or not only because Columba and his community were there. It was probably a spiritual place before they arrived. But it is a remarkable place for uh, all kinds of reasons. Not the least of them being this particular manuscript. This manuscript is a famous manuscript for anybody who's interested in early Irish uh, history, early uh, English history, uh, all kinds of things. It was the subject of a wonderful two volume facsimile that was produced here under the supervision of Professor Damien Bracken, whom I see there, and I'm delighted to see uh, a really, really valuable contribution to scholarship, a beautiful, beautiful, full color facsimile of this manuscript, which is really the sort of jewel in the crown for anybody who's interested in the history, the early history and development of Irish script, the Irish hand, as it's called, and which has that title in Tim O'Neill's famous book, justly famous book, The Irish Hand. And um, this is the famous Schaffhausen Adolfnan. Adolfnan was the ninth abbot of Iona, died in 704, um, was the author of this and various other texts, but this is the life of Columba, uh, the Vita Columbae. Uh, this almost certainly, this particular copy was almost certainly the in-house copy, the official copy prepared for the community of Iona. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful manuscript for all kinds of reasons. Um, it's preserved in Schaffhausen. Those of you who are Sherlock Holmes aficionados might have heard of Schaffhausen. It's near the Rhine Falls where our hero met his end with Moriarty. So if you find yourself either as a, a Sherlock Holmes aficionado or as uh, an enthusiast for early Irish history or early Irish script or whatever, if you find yourself near the Rhine Falls, then you should take yourself to Schaffhausen. They love to see you coming. Those of you who are Irish, I can tell you, um, our friends uh, in the library in Schaffhausen will recognize you from 50 paces and will roll out the red carpet. You are especially welcome as Irish visitors. Mm -hmm. And they are especially proud of this manuscript because it really is one, one of the most beautiful manuscripts ever produced in these islands. This is the opening page, as you can see, a relatively modest production by comparison, say, with Bede's Historia Ecclesiastica that I showed you in its BL copy. Uh, again, very, very interesting for all kinds of reasons. Um, Adobnan, the author of the Vita Columbae, was not himself a contemporary of his subject, so he didn't know Columba personally, but he has all kinds of interesting information. And indeed, uh, even for somebody who wasn't necessarily obsessed by early Irish history, there's an awful lot of incidental information in Adobnan's Vita Columbae, 
which is of interest to historians of other periods and other subjects and so on. Um, generally speaking, if you combine the two, okay, if you combine Bede's Historia Ecclesiastica uh, with the Vita Columbae, you get a, a very interesting picture of the way Christianity had developed in these islands in the period, roughly speaking, from the foundation of Iona, as I say, 563, up to the death of Columba in, uh, it used to be believed 597, uh, but we now believe it was 593 after the work of Dan McCarthy. Uh, there's no point in going to Donegal and trying to convince the natives of Donegal that their hero died in 597, but the rest of us can at least uh, toy with the idea that the date might have been a different one. Um, there's Ione again on the map, and again you see how relatively, or at least theoretically, isolated it is from everywhere else in these islands, and yet it's still the center of pretty much everything that's going on. This particular um, illustration here, it's from an article that was produced by a former student of mine, Vera Orschel, in History Ireland many years ago. I'll show it to you again before I finish. Um, and the idea is to show not so much the Irish presence in England, but the English presence in Ireland. Uh, the article itself is on the subject of Mayo, Mayo Abbey, a famous monastery that I'll come back to before I finish. But in this case, from an illustrative point of view, the idea is to show that Irish influence is heavy, is obvious, is, is important on the offshore island throughout this period, but that there is a corresponding, a parallel influence of Anglo-Saxons in this island. Uh, throughout the same period. The map isn't intended to imply that all of those sites on the, the map of Ireland are Anglo-Saxon. You can see there's a T. Saxon down in the south and not, not far from here, I'd imagine. And uh, there's a T. Saxon in Galway, just outside the city in the suburbs. There's Inish Boffin, which I'll come to in a moment, and its related church Mayo, Myona Saxon, which all the way down to the 16th century and beyond was always referred to locally as Myona Saxon in Irish. Mayo of the Saxons. Uh, Inchigil, the island monastery of Inchigil on Loch Corrib, um, which I would recommend also if you want to find a, a holiday venue. Um, it depends uh, on your circumstances. Um, Inchigil, the island monastery of Inchigil on Loch Corrib is part of uh, the famous hotel that was on the tip of my tongue and which I've forgotten in the meantime. Ashford Castle, thank you very much. We have a very learned audience. I'm happy to keep filling in the gaps I leave. Uh, these are all test questions, of course. Um, Ashford Castle, um, you might want to go because it's very near Clifton and it's very near the quiet man scene if you're into you know, John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara, that kind of thing. Alternatively, if you're a James Bond fan, uh, Ashford Castle is where Pierce Brosnan was married. Okay. <laughs> As Michael Caine used to say, uh, not many people know that. <laughs> and you know why. Um, but anyway, Inchigil actually has a wonderful, wonderful uh, set of um, ecclesiastical remains and a really spectacular site, which Father Gorian, who's here with us in the audience, and uh, Quibeen and, and other scholars would know uh, as being an extraordinary monument of the Irish language. Uh, and John is here as well, John Carey, who I think has written on the subject. Uh, very learnedly. Um, in Shigil is worth it um, for the reason no less that the name means the island of the foreigner, in Chrafig, uh, the island of the pious foreigner, whoever the pious foreigner was, we don't know, but it is evidence of a, a presence of a non-Irish, a non-native person in an ecclesiastical setting. The site that you see there um, underlined as Ra Maelshi, that's not my spelling, that's uh, History Ireland's spelling, that's the site that we all know and love as Rath Melshiga, okay? Uh, Clon Melchin County Carlin. But I do want you just to look for a moment and, and to dwell on the fact that um, it, it's a, a, a diptych, so to speak. We're looking at a two part opening. We're looking at the right hand side, the offshore island, with the presence of so many Irish people, most of whom are mentioned by Bede. Although, interestingly enough, it's worth pointing out that um, Bede mentions by name more Anglo Saxons who were in Ireland or who had Irish connections than he does mention Irish people by name who were in Britain. If you actually talk to two parallel lists, you see that he actually appears to know more, at least has the detailed information about the names of Anglo-Saxons who were here in Ireland in this period, compared to the Irish who loom so large in Bede's history otherwise. 
We know about some of them, we don't know about others. This is not far from us, Kalilis, uh, a wonderful, wonderful inscription. This is the kind of thing that Jennifer would have told us so much about. She was so expert on the early medieval historical aspects of our islands, our, our, our uh, mutual relations, but also the art historical element behind a lot of what we're talking about. And I won't dare to say anything other than that's been pointed out by those more learned in the subject than I, that this particular uh, cross is strikingly reminiscent of a page in the Lindisfarne Gospels, the famous Lindisfarne Gospels. Why that is the case is a moot point. We can argue the toss. Um, more interesting, perhaps, is the inscription on this uh, slab. Quicumque uh, hunc titulum legeret orat pro berichtwine. Whoever reads this title, an interesting use of the word titulus, whoever reads this inscription, uh, let him pray for somebody called Berechtwinne. Who Berechtwinne was, we don't know. It's a sort of Irishization of a name. It would be Björtwinne, I think, although I'm in the presence of Anglo-Saxon scholars here, so I, again, need to be careful about what I do or say. Um, but it is a striking example of the presence of Anglo-Saxons in Ireland in our period. Why? What brought this person here? Who he was? Where he came from? All of these are questions we could ask, but we can't answer, unfortunately, at least on the basis of present knowledge. When you read Bede, generally speaking, the Historia Ecclesiastica, of course, has this wonderful story about the Irish in England, the role played by Irish missionary monks sent originally from Iona to the north of England to um, Lindisfarne in this case. I'm sorry, I don't have a better illustration, but this is what Lindisfarne looks like more or less now, the remains of it. Uh, an island monastery off the northeast of England that you saw on the map and that we might see again before we finish. Its history is told in extraordinary detail by Bede, and it's a fascinating story about the Irish, relating not just to the activities of the Irish in Christian terms, in missionary terms, let's say, but also because there's a political background. The reason why the Irish are invited to Northumbria is because Anglo-Saxon royals are in exile on Iona. They are political exiles, as we would say, um, and it's because they managed to uh, retain or to, to return to Northumbria and to regain the kingdom of Northumbria, which had been uh, in their father's possession before them. Um, and because they were grateful to the fact that the community of Iona had provided them with protection and, and support and so on. It's for that reason that the Irish are invited, principally the Irish are invited to, to Northumbria. So there is always a political connection. It's utterly anachronistic to assume that any of the things that I'm talking to you about or any of the artifacts, any of the places, any of the events that I happen to talk about, that they take a, a place in isolation. There is always a political side and uh, a religious side. They are inseparable. We may find that anachronistic. We talk about the separation of church and state. Medievals would have laughed at you. They wouldn't know what you were talking about. They would have thought you were stupid to try and separate church and state. And from our point of view, it doesn't make any sense. But in this case, we're talking about um, the Irish community that came from Iona. Very, very interesting story indeed about it and its background. It relates principally to the person called Aidan, Aidan of Lindisfarne, uh, here represented in a modern um, sculpture. I don't know why Aidan is clutching an ice cream cone. <laughs> um, it may be a symbol of peace or whatever uh, that he brought to, I, uh, to, to, to Lindisfarne. I have no idea. Um, but Aidan is, in many respects, the, the central figure, or, or in certain minds, I suppose, and probably most people, most readers of uh, Bede's Historia Ecclesiastica, probably would regard Aidan as the central figure, at least in relation to the role of the Irish in the conversion of the Northumbrians. Whether that is the case or not um, is worth a second reading and a third reading of Bede's prose, because he has certain things to say about Aidan which are demonstrably positive, and there are other things that he says about Aidan which are quite the contrary. He says, for example, of Aidan's Easter practice, that he detests them. Bede, of course, was an expert on Easter, um, himself uh, very, very proficient in the calculation of, of the date of Easter and so on, who published two manuals on the subject. So he knew what he was talking about. But he, he, he states quite categorically and in language which is unusual for Bede, that he detests Aidan's Easter practices and the practice that was followed by the community of Iona, uh, on foot of what their founder had brought with him from Ireland, the, the famous 84 year Easter cycle, and which persisted on Iona all the way down to the year 716. Uh, the Iona community was very, very insistent on following the traditions of their founder uh, in the face of all kinds of arguments. And Bede is conscious of that fact, so that for all that he finds Aidan 
a, a laudable figure, a wonderful figure in many respects. He does make the point that on the subject of Easter, he was not heretical, interestingly enough, though some of his contemporaries did actually accuse the Irish of being heretics on the subject of Easter. Reed is very careful not to make that statement. Um, but at the same time, you're in no doubt about where he stands regarding Aidan's and Iona's battles relating to Easter. Now, so where does that lead us in relation to our friend Edgebert? Edgebert is in here um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, how does he become the hero of Bede's history, given the role, the very central and important role played by Aidan, particularly in the establishment, first of all, of, of what we would call Irish Christianity in the north of England in the early part of the seventh century, and then its ultimate dissemination through the rest of uh, England, certainly down to the Midlands uh, by the, the mid or latter part of the seventh century. Pater Edgbert features here in a very interesting document which is appended to another manuscript of Bede's history. As I said previously, there are three or four manuscripts of Bede's history that are roughly contemporary. This is the so-called Moor Bede, named after Archbishop Moore, who was the owner of the manuscript and who donated it to the, uh, the University Library in Cambridge. It's one of their prides and joy. It may well be their pride and joy. In fact, it's a, it's a very, very interesting manuscript for a whole variety of reasons. One of them being, if you just look at it, that is what the Moore bead looks like. OK, I'll show you another page before I finish. But by comparison, say, with the manuscript of the same text in the British Library, the Cotton manuscript in, in the BL, this is a very plain copy. There's no ornamentation, there's no decoration, there's nothing fancy about this manuscript. And yet there is this edition, uh, there is this appendix, this memorandum, which is added after the text. I'll show you before I finish the precise context in which it occurs, which is a sort of potted history, as it were, of England, a potted history of, of Anglo-Saxon England from the foundation, that's to say, from the Adventus Saxonum, from the arrival of the English, uh, whatever date you want to put on that, all the way down to the end of Northumbrian history in Bede's time. And the line that you have there at the bottom of that particular text talks about a particular year. We happen to know that it's the year 729, where he says, or, or rather somebody says, I'll come back to that in a moment. We're not absolutely sure who's doing the writing here, or who's doing the talking. Whoever added the Moore Memorandum made a triangulation, as it were, between the earliest kings of Northumbria. What you're looking at is a list of the early Northumbrian kings from Ida in 547, all the way down to Bede's own king in 731, Caelwulf. And then there is the Adventus Saxonum, which is mentioned at the end, and then from which things are calculated. It's a two-way calculation. There is the, the, the regnal succession going in one direction, and then in the opposite direction, as I say, in a form of triangulation, there is the calculation so many years from the Adventus Saxonum. And in the middle of that, there is a reference here to our friend Pater Edgbert Transivit at Christum. Father Edgbert passed to Christ. OK, now why? What is Pater Edgbert doing there? OK, I need to explain uh, what's going on here. Now, I mentioned the point before that none of this is intelligible if you try to separate out the politics from the ecclesiastical side of things. And if one wanted to go into all the detail, the minute and difficult detail of the affiliations of all the people that uh, I'm talking about and won't have time to talk about, it is very complicated. OK, I made an attempt at one stage to work on the prosopography. That's a great word. I like using that word prosopography. Um, it's everything you know about individual people. It's like putting together a dossier. A prosopography is a, uh, a list, and almost an encyclopedia. Then you have Wikipedia as a sort of prosopography of, of famous people. Okay? And the prosopography of Anglo-Saxon royal exile in the 6th and 7th centuries was an attempt that I made to explain the circumstances around the fact that so many of these Anglo-Saxons left their homeland and came to Ireland or in some cases went to Scotland, in some cases went to Iona, or whatever the case may be. We know from Bede's history that, in fact, some royal exiles tried to make it to the continent. In some cases they did in the time of Dagobert I, Le Roi Dagobert, the famous Dagobert I, the Merovingian Frankish king who died in 739, um, 639, I beg your pardon. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the kings of Northumbria uh, met a, a sorry end and his wife, his widow, made off with their sons uh, down to Kent because she herself was a Kentish woman uh, in the hopes that she would be protected, she'd be safe, but she wasn't. 
uh, not least because the King of Kent, uh, although he was her brother, was not at all inclined to, to uh, provide her with the protection that she needed and wanted. And they fled to the Merovingian, to the Frankish kingdom in France. And they were still caught up with in the end. The sons were murdered uh, on the continent. Uh, Bede, Bede has a number of accounts of the vicious, venomous, nasty, dangerous vendettas that were carried out by Anglo-Saxon royalty against each other, Anglo-Saxon royalty and nobility. Um, some of it, if, if you think about it in modern terms, if you think of Macbeth, the story of Macbeth is a wonderful Shakespearean reenactment of the kind of circumstances that you find related in Bede's history regularly. And many of the things that you find in Bede's history are paralleled to a remarkable degree in Shakespeare, but also in other things as well. But as I say, for anybody who wanted to trace the interrelationships of these periods, of these people rather, um, it can be done. And the ramifications arising from those interrelations can be worked out, but it is very complicated. It's very difficult. And I cannot argue, I cannot assert that I have worked out the interrelationships of the people I'm talking about to any way satisfactorily, but there are suggestions that can be made. Okay, now the year 664 is a big year. OK, it's, it's a big year. Those of you who read your cellars in Yates, you know, 1066 and all that, will know that uh, 664 is uh, an annus mirabilis in terms of English history. Most people who know their English history, most English people who know their history, think of 664 as the year in which the Synod of Whitby took place. Supposedly the Big Bang, um, when the Irish came into contact with the English or the Anglo-Saxons and the Anglo-Saxons decided they no longer had any need of us and they packed us off and we all went home in a sulk. And in that context, following the result of the Synod of Whitby, you have the famous evacuation of Coleman of Lindisfarne with his monks, first of all to Inishbofin. You saw Inishbofin on the first map I showed you. And then because there was supposedly a disagreement between the Irish monks on Inishbofin and the Anglo-Saxon monks or the English monks who had joined Coleman, uh, after the decision of 664, that uh, arising from that disagreement that the, mon the, the monastery, the foundation of Mayo was established for those particular former Lindisfarne monks. Okay, that's the main event, if you like, of 664, and it's interesting. Um, I've gone on too far there. Um, 664 is the Synod of Whitby, but it's also a plague year, a very important plague year. Um, and in fact, the plague is especially important in the context of those Anglo-Saxons who found themselves in Ratsmelchica at the time of the event. Uh, I could say all kinds of things about it. I haven't the time to go through the detail of it. But uh, B does mention, as I say, a long list of individuals by name who happen to be in Ratsmelchica. There were others elsewhere, as we know, Talilis and all these other places. But Bede is especially interested in Ratsmelchica, and it's the people in Ratsmelchica that he has most to say about. And he talks about two individuals, for example, two brothers, Athelwina and Athelthun, who were there, one of whom survived, the other didn't. Uh, Athelwina actually survived the plague and came back to Anglo-Saxon England, to Northumbria. Uh, Lindsay, in fact, he became the Bishop of Lindsay. Um, Kinefrid, Kedda, Chad, Edgbert, Wichtbert, Willebrord, Ewald, Ewaldus Niger and Ewaldus uh, the White, uh, two brothers again. These are all mentioned individually by Bede as having been members of the Anglo-Saxon community in Rathmelchica. The story is famous. I, I, I'll give you the past. Most Several people in the audience could recite it for you if I asked them to, but I wouldn't like to embarrass them by putting the finger on them. But this is what Bede himself says. In this year of our Lord 664, there was an eclipse of the sun on the 3rd of May, about four o'clock in the afternoon. In the same year, a sudden pestilence first depopulated the southern parts of Britain and afterwards attacked the kingdom of Northumbria raging far and wide with cruel devastation and laying low a vast number of people. At this time, there were in England, this is Colgrave's translation, there were in England both nobles and commoners who in the days of bishops Finon and Colomon had left their own country and retired to Ireland, either for the sake of religious studies or to live a more ascetic life. In course of time, some of those devoted themselves faithfully to the monastic life, while others preferred to travel round to the cells of various teachers and apply themselves to study. The Irish welcomed them all gladly, gave them their daily food, 
and also provided them with books to read and with instruction without asking for any payment. Famous, famous occasion. OK, book three, chapter 27. Uh, they all came over and we all gave them B&B and books and teaching so on for nothing. OK, now um, I could say something about that, but I won't. Um, he continues, among these were two young Englishmen of great ability named Athelton and Egbert, both of noble birth. The former Athelton was a brother of Athelwina, a man equally beloved of God, who later on also went to Ireland to study. And when he had been well grounded, he returned to his native land and was made bishop in the kingdom of Linsk, over which he ruled for a long time with great distinction. Athelton and Etchbert were in a monastery which the Irish call Rath Melchica, and all their companions were carried off by the plague or scattered about in various places, while they themselves were both stricken by the same disease. An aged and venerable priest, a most truthful man, told me this story about Edgbert, declaring that he had heard it from his own lips. When Edgbert thought that he was on the point of death, Early in the morning, he left the infirmary where all the sick lay and found in a convenient spot in which to be alone. There he began earnestly to consider his, pre his previous life. He was so stricken with remorse at the memory of his sins that he wept bitterly and prayed God with all his heart that he might not die until he had time to make amends for all the thoughtless offences of which he had been guilty during infancy and boyhood and to practice good works and abundantly. He also made a vow that he would live in exile and never return to his native land, Britain. That in addition to psalms and prayers and so on and so on and so forth. OK, that's the famous story of Edgbert and the plague and the survival of the plague and the vow that he vowed that if he survived, he would never return to his native England. Okay? Now, you might ask yourself, well, what was Edgbert doing in England in the, or in Ireland in the first place? What were any of these people doing in Rath Melchica in the first place? It's an interesting question. Uh, we don't know the answer. Bede tells you that they're there, studia literarum, whatever it is, for the sake of studying the Bible. And if you believe that, you'd believe anything. Okay? These guys, for the most part, at least in the initial years of their exile, are clearly political exiles. These guys are in Ireland because it is too dangerous to be in England, certainly too dangerous to be in Northumbria. Now, why Rasmelchiga? I wish I could tell you. I've been at this long enough that I should be able to tell you, but I don't know. I don't know what the origin is of Rasmelchiga or why Edgbert and Wichtbert and Willibrord, whom I'll come to in a moment, found themselves in this particular place at this particular time. It may have to do with that individual who's there on the chart called Kinefrid, um, who we are told, not by Bede, interestingly enough, but by the anonymous author of The Lives of the Abbots of Wearmouth Jarrow, an interesting text, a parallel text, if you like, to Bede's, which has some interesting additional information. It says that Kinefrid was actually the older brother of Bede's abbot. That Kaelfrid that you saw mentioned on the dedication stone, the man in whose abbacy, in the fourth year of whose abbacy, uh, Jarrow was dedicated by King Edgerith. That Helfrid had an older brother who had been in the monastery of Gilling and who eventually had given up the monastery of Gilling and gone to Ireland. Now, Bede says, or rather the anonymous says, for the study of scripture, and maybe he did. Um, I suspect that it's because the political temperature in Northumbria was at such a height that hanging around oh. Gilling wasn't a sensible thing to do. Okay, um, A lot of what we're talking about has to do with... Um, what our American friends used to call it, regime change. When there is a regime change, various things happen. OK, nowadays, these things are all very civilized. If there's a regime change in the United States, the uh, the furniture van shows up in front or behind, I suppose, the White House and all the effects of the outgoing president are loaded up and he passes into history. OK, in the old days, uh, when regime change happened, you got the next available flight out of Northumbria. Otherwise, you would probably go out in a plastic bag if they had such a thing. It was very, very dangerous, particularly dangerous for those who survived the regime change. That's to say, if a king falls off his horse or is helped to fall off his horse and is killed, 
then his family and his nearest relatives are in mortal danger and they have a choice to make either to hang around and make the best of it or to make a run for it. In many cases, I suspect in most of the cases that we're talking about, the people we have here, the people who are mentioned by BE that haven't come to Ireland, made a run for it. Um, we have other references in other sources in the Irish Annals, for example, and then a few other sources as well to some of these people who who do make an attempt to regain the lost kingdoms that they had um, forsaken, as it were. And some of them are successful, some of them are not. Uh, two of them were successful in the 630s, and that's why the Irish monks of Iona were invited to Northumbria, Oswald, Osview and their brothers. Uh, and one sister, I think, did make it back to Northumbria, did manage to regain the throne that had belonged to their father, but they were exceptional. It's not always the case. And there are several other instances that we know of where individuals made an attempt to regain the throne. One of them is mentioned there in the Moore Memorandum, and I'll come back to him again before I finish. Um, and they're unsuccessful. They simply disappear. They lose out in the game of history, and that's the end of it. Think of your Macbeth. Okay, it's all exactly as it was in the early Middle Ages. In this case, Kinefrith almost certainly got out uh, because he had to get out. His brother stayed, Kelfrith, and eventually became abbot of Jarrow, as we know, Bede's abbot. Uh, and an interesting character in his own right for all kinds of reasons. Kedda, Chad, and various other people whom Bede mentions all show up sooner or later in Ireland, all show up sooner or later in the company of Edgbert in Rathmelchica for one reason or another. Some of them, as you saw, went back. Our friend Athelwyn went back and became a bishop rather than a king. Um, but some of them stayed. And Edgbert certainly stayed because he vowed he would never go back. And he stuck to his vow. OK, now what exactly the implication of that um, is we'll come to before I finish. Now, in regard to my claim, if it is a claim or, or, or the, the premise of my talk, so to speak, that Edgbert is the the hero of the Historia Ecclesiastica. It is interesting to see the terminology that Bede uses when he's talking about them. OK, I'm not going to through, go through all of this list, but he, he, you have here the various titles and um, what he is uh, officially referred to as, whether he's a priest or a bishop or a pater or um, whatever the case may be. They're all there. There are different terms used by Bede and they're interesting in their own way. Um, and you have at the very end, uh, at the very end of this passage here, book three, chapter 27, Bede says that Nuper recently, it est anno dominica incarnationis um, 729, cum est ipse anorum uh, non aginte, migravit ad regna ecclesia. In the year 729, and note the anno domini dating, anno dominica incarnationis, which wasn't on the dedication stone, you remember, but it's here in Bede's history. In the year of our Lord, AD, as we used to call it before we were told to call it something else, um, AD 729, when he was 90 years, come said, Monaginta, migravit ad regna celeste. He, he migrated to the heavenly kingdom. Okay, 90 years, 90 years. There's something in the water in Carlo, um, because another member of the community that I'll come to in a moment died in his 82nd year. There was definitely something around Clonmel to be recommended. Uh, even if you are in political exile. This is the sole surviving archaeological, I suppose we could call it, artifact in Clonmelt today. Um, the remains of a high cross. It may have been higher. I don't know if there's another part of the shaft hidden under the ground. It's never been the subject of uh, an archaeological dig, I'm ashamed to say. And there are hundreds, thousands almost. I think I would say it was reckoned to be about 80,000 rats uh, ring forts and so on, um, listen and so on in Ireland from the medieval period, almost none of which have been excavated. Uh, Irish archaeologists have prepared to spend their time um, chasing sunbeams down New Grange and places like that, rather than digging historically attested sites like Clonmelchig or Rathmelchig to see whether or not there might be anything under the ground. A sort of um, expert was here kind of stone may well be under there somewhere waiting to be found. But this is the sole surviving um, remains of what might have been um, a decorated cross. This is an image taken back in the 1980s by some local enthusiasts. Um, uh, I put it in here to give you an idea of the height, to give you the context uh, of this particular cross. Now, we happen to know about Rathmelchig for all kinds of reasons to do not with beads, but with other sources. Luckily, we have uh, access to a, an impressive amount of material 
which either originated in Rathmetrica itself or was produced by monks who had uh, received their training or their formation in Rathmetrica. This is one of the most famous documents from our period, Willebrord's calendar. You saw Willebrord mentioned um, a moment ago, and I'll come back to Willebrord in a minute. He, he could be regarded as um, an acolyte, if you like, of Edgeberts uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, this is the famous Willebrord calendar. It's a manuscript in Paris now, the Bibliothèque Nationale. Um, very, very interesting manuscript for GAM for all kinds of reasons. For those who are interested in script, it has a, an entire alphabet of the script that was current at the time. Um, for those who are interested in decoration, you can see there at the top of the page, the Calende abbreviation and how it's decorated with um, myriad red dots and all that kind of thing. And the sort of minimal kind of um, palette of colors, as it were, there's red, black, uh, yellow, and a few others as well. And also the interesting elaboration of the, uh, the Calende K into the form of an animal head or a dog head or a bird head or something like that. For most people, however, the real importance of this particular page is what uh, you see there in the left hand margin of the November page. It's regarded as the oldest datable autograph surviving English handwriting. So if you are a true born Englishman or woman and you want to know what is the oldest example of handwriting datable and identifiable by an English person, this is almost certainly the leading candidate. Um, in nomine Domini, Clemens Willebrodus, Anno Sextentesimo Nona Gesimo, Ab Incarnazione Christi, Veniebat Ultramare in Francia. Very, very interesting. In the year 690, a man called Willebrod, the man we call Willebrod, but here given a double name, Clemens, for reasons I can't go into, came across the water, venie bat ultramare, across the sea in Francia. And that's exactly what Willebrod did. In the year 690, mm -hmm. he left Rathmelschica. He left the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon, if that's what it is, or the mixed community in Rathmelschica, and undertook missionary activity on the continent, in the first place in Frisia, and then subsequently elsewhere. Um, but in this case, he actually subsequently, I think it's datable to 728, this particular note, he actually gives a potted history of his career to date and dates the note to 728. So if you want your oldest example of English handwriting, it's horrible handwriting, which just goes to show. You can be a saint for all you like, but it, does, it won't naturally improve your handwriting. Okay? Um, this is actually where it all began for me, okay? Uh, none of the pages I showed you before, none of the decorative manuscripts that we're all interested in, uh, in one way or another, um, not even the Historia Ecclesiastica to a certain extent. This is the page that sort of attracted my attention and drew me into all this discussion way back when uh, in the early 1980s. It's a, it's an Easter table, as it says there. Okay, It's the Easter table for the years 684-702, the 19 year period 684 uh, 702. Now, I'm not going to take you. You'll be happy to hear. I'm not going to drag you through the finer points of East. Easter's for consenting adults only. <laughs> um, it's complicated. Um, it's convoluted. In the Irish context, it's more convoluted than anywhere else, you could almost say, because there are discrepancies in the usage regarding Easter and Easter practice and how to calculate the date of Easter. This is particularly interesting because we know, I think at least we know, I think it can be demonstrated that this particular Easter table, extending over the years 684 to 702, was actually written in Rath Metrica. That is really the bottom line, as far as I'm concerned, in the discussion of all the various um, people and dates and data and manuscripts that we associate with Rath Metrica. Um, it's an Easter table for 684 to 702, and therefore almost certainly must have been written in around 684, the opening year. For it to be of any use, it must have been written towards the beginning or before the beginning rather than at the end. Interestingly enough, there's nothing on the back of this page, okay? The back of this particular page is blank, okay? You're looking at the recto side here, folio 44 recto. On folio 44 verso, there's nothing. There's a few doodles, but there's no continuation of that Easter table. So that whoever wrote this Easter table, whoever had this Easter table, needed it for the years 684 to 702. We know, that Willebrod left Rathmetri, and he told us himself that he left Rathmetri in 690. You can do the math, 684, 690. It must be the case that that table was still in Rathmetri in 684 and before, okay? In which case you were looking at the script of Rathmetri, for want of a better term, okay? Somebody's script. 
Um, this particular manuscript, this particular page rather, is bound in with the calendar of Willebrod that I showed you before. The, the calendar of Willebrod is actually made up of two separate manuscripts, the so-called martyrology, which is the second part, and this um, calendar, which is the first part. And in between, there are various bits and pieces bound in, and one is this particular table. Okay, So it all comes from Rathmelschka, as far as I'm concerned. It may not all have been written in Rathmelschka, but that doesn't matter. And the script of Rathmelschka is what we're talking about here. OK. Now, as I say, this has to do with Easter, the Synod of Whitby, 664, the triumph of the 19 year Easter table, the so-called Dionysiac Easter table and all this kind of thing, which is the subject of all kinds of things, including some um, modern, how would you describe it, uh, creative literature. Um, this is Peter Tremaine, better known to some of you as Peter Beresford Ellis. Um, very interesting character and highly qualified in Celtic studies, I'd have you know. And this is the first of the many volumes that he published about Sister Fidelma, if you're into medieval detectives, OK? It's very interesting, A, because it's a detective, and B, it's a female, it's Fidelma, and she's Irish, and the whole thing is absolution by murder, and the whole thing takes race, takes place in the context of the Synod of Whitby. That's, that's the context, OK? That's what we're, we're looking at. I haven't flipped it. Don't worry, I, I did take my pills this morning. This isn't in here for no obvious reason. It's here for a reason. But um, 664, the year, the Annus Mirabilis of, of Whitby, was also a year of eclipse. Okay, you remember the opening part of Bede's Book 3, Chapter 27, described it as a year of a total solar eclipse. And then very shortly after that, he says, or does he? Maybe in the same breath, as it were, there is the advent of the plague. Now, I just threw this in because some of you might remember, some of us who are not as old, or, or, or as young as others might remember the, the, the great hullabaloo that there was in these parts when there was a total solar eclipse around uh, 1999. Um, it, it passed out just over Dover, over the very bottom tip of the island of Britain. So we didn't get the full um, value, as it were. But it just struck my fancy when I saw the title, like the end of the world, a total solar eclipse, if you've seen it, is a striking event for all kinds of things. And you can imagine it must have been an even more striking event for people in the Middle Ages who must have wondered what was happening, what is going on here? Um, this is the path of the total solar eclipse over uh, these islands in the year 664, okay? Now, if you look at it carefully, um, if you wanted to, if you were Irish, let's say, or if you liked the Irish, or uh, for whatever reason, you might point out that, well, actually, the total eclipse passed over only Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> okay? It didn't actually darken Lindisfarne, it didn't darken Iona, it didn't darken other churches where the Irish were. Uh, it's all English, okay? Jaro. Wearmouth, Speed's Monastery, <laughs> Hartlepool, Whitby, Ripon, Lastingham, Gilling, where Kinefrid was, and, and maybe Kelfred, York, the seat of a bishopric, after all, since the time of Gregory, supposedly, of an archbishopric. All these places are, are plunged into total darkness, OK, but not the Irish. So you can imagine the Irish saying, <laughs> <laughs> But unfortunately, we don't know the date of the Synod of Whitby, OK? If the Synod of Whitby took place, um, shortly before the total eclipse. Then you can imagine the Irish saying, well, we tell it is out. You're gonna you throw us out and see what happens. Okay. Alternatively, somebody could say, well, this is a sign, you know, we are surrounded by these Irish. We are uh, in darkness. It's time to move away from these Irish and 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 adopt different ways of doing things. So unfortunately, Bede, for all that he's a stickler for detail and dates and chronology and all that kind of thing, doesn't actually give us a date for the synod. Whitby. We don't know what time of year it happened. Now, those of you who are observant, and that must be all of you, I presume, will notice from the caption that the date of the total eclipse in this diagram is the 1st of May. Okay, But remember, Bede, at the opening of Book 3, Chapter 27, said that the total eclipse took place on the 3rd of May. <laughs> Bede says it three times, in case you missed it the first time. He says it three times in all in his history and in the, uh, the, the chronology at the end of it. He says the total solar eclipse in 664 took place on the 3rd of May. It didn't. It took place on May Day, the 1st of May, which is 
accordingly recorded in Irish sources, in the annals and so on, and in other sources. And Bede, for reasons of his own, gives a different date, okay? But it's important to bear all these things in mind and to take them all uh, in conjunction, okay? We know, I said before, uh, very briefly, that the Synod of Whitby resulted in the Anglo-Saxon Church in Northumbria deciding that it wanted to part company with the Irish. It wanted to adopt Roman ways, whatever they might have been. And the Irish rather preferred to hang on to Irish ways, the 84-year table, for example, that was uh, in use by Iona and its satellite churches, which the community of Lindisfarne refused to give up, or at least Colmon and the Irish on Lindisfarne decided they did not want to abandon in favour of the new the reckoning. So they left the island, they left uh, Lindisfarne. In the first place, they went back to Iona. Then from Iona, they went to Inishbofin. And then, as I say, from Inishbofin, you have the foundation of Mayo of the Saxons. All of this related in wonderful detail by my uh, former student, Peter Orshin, in this very, very fine article in History Ireland way back when. It's Anglo-Saxon Mayo. Uh, Anglo-Saxon Mayo, as far as I can tell, has nothing to do with Etchbert Arath Melchior. If you read through this, oh man, there's mountains of books on Bede and, and early Anglo-Saxon history, and you'll always see um, Mayo brought into the subject, okay, brought into the discussion, although there's an absolutely no demonstrable connection between Arath Melchior uh, and Mayo in this case. There, there probably were, it would be anachronistic to think that there were no connections between all those different Anglo-Saxon monasteries that I talked to you about at the outset, Tisax and Inchigil, all the rest. Obviously, there must have been some connection, but there's no formal nexus, if you like. There's no real formal connection between the two. And the fact that Mayo is founded after 664 and that Inchbofin is founded after 664 doesn't necessarily have any great say for what's happening in Rathmelchica. It is important, it is interesting, um, it is remarkable, um, that the community of Rathmeshka seems to have expounded the Dionysiac reckoning from the outset. There's no, absolutely no whiff at any stage in any source that I'm aware of that Etchbert and his community had at a previous occasion used the Irish so-called 84-year Easter table uh, and then reverted to the, the so-called Roman or Dionysiac or 19-year Easter table. That doesn't come across. The, the community at Rathmelchica seems to be utterly orthodox from the beginning, from as far back as we can go. And it's 19 years, it's Dionysiac, it's, it's Roman uh, usage and so on. So from that point of view, um, you could say the Synod of, of Whitby doesn't have a direct influence on uh, our friend Etchbert or his community in Rathmelchica, except that it does. Um, because you will remember that Bede tells us that Edgbert vowed a vow never return to his native country. Okay, never vow, never to return to his native country. An interesting point. Um, and you are told also that he was going to devote, if he survived the plague of 664, he was going to devote his life uh, to spreading the gospel in the first place to the Germans and then uh, in other circumstances elsewhere. Um, Charles Plummer, the great. English historian, the man who did the wonderful uh, standard edition of Bede's history, uh, remarks dryly at one point that Edgbert took his time about carrying out God's uh, diktats and this and other regards. Uh, in many cases, 20 or 30 years, uh, in the case of his visit to Iona, that will come to at the end, anywhere up to 50 years. He doesn't seem to have been in any great rush uh, to do these things. But he does um, as part of his vow to, to, to spread the gospel, in particular amongst the, uh, the fellow countrymen, or rather um, fellow Germans, in this case Germans on the continent, he means the old Saxons and so on, uh, he does undertake to carry out a mission to the continent. He does spit out a mission. He does all the preparations to take a mission to the continent in the period around 680 something or other. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and then there's a wonderful passage in Bede where there is a visitation, there's a night visitation. All the best things happen at night in Bede, okay? All these dreams that you were told about. In this case, Edgbert is all set to undertake his continental mission, and he has uh, a visit from a member of his community who'd had a dream the previous night. And in the dream, somebody told him, somebody who knew Edgbert, told him to tell Edgbert not to go to the continent that that was not the place to go, that his destiny was elsewhere. Okay, Edgbert, like a good boss, said, keep your mouth shut, say nothing to anybody about this, and kept going. The next night, the same person has another visitation, 
again from the person who spoke to him the previous night and said, why did you not tell Edgebert that he's not to go on the mission? And he said, well, I did. Well, tell him again. So the next day he goes to Edgebert and he says he's had a repeat visitation. And the visitation says, no, 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 the continental mission is not for you. And Edgebert just cannot get it into his head. And the only reason why he doesn't go in the end is that his ship, after it has been fitted out and kitted out for the, the mission to the continent, is actually wrecked. It's thrown up on, on the shore. It's wrecked. And he finally, the penny drops. You might say he's thick. But in this case, the penny finally drops and he decides not to undertake the continental mission. But he doesn't give up. He actually chooses somebody else. He's a very clever man. He chooses somebody else. And in this case, the person he chooses is a man called Wichtbert. And Wichtbert actually did go to the continent. But Wichtbert, having spent, I think it is two, maybe three years amongst the Frisians, gave them up as hopeless, hopeless lot. And he went back to Rathmelfing and said, these guys are just incorrigible. There's no point. And yet Edgebert persisted. Uh, he didn't give up at that point. He said, we'll try one more time. And the person he chose was our friend Willebrord. And Willebrord left Ireland. You remember the uh, autograph statement he has in the margin, the November page of his calendar. He says in the year 690, Willebrord left Ireland and veniebat ultramare in Francia, which is what he did. And there's a whole chapter then of Anglo-Saxon history, missionary history, I suppose we would call it on the continent, which surrounds our friend uh, Willebrord, particularly associated with the site of Echtenach. Uh, and greetings to all our friends down in Clonmel, uh, who will uh, be familiar with all this material. Um, Willebrord founded the Church of Echtenach and various other churches, and it is still a very important ecclesiastical site in present-day Luxembourg. Echtenach is in Luxembourg, and Willebrord is regarded as the uh, apostle of the Low Countries. Uh, he was very successful, where Wichtbert before him was less successful, and where poor Edgebert never got a chance really at all. Okay, but they all came from Rathmelschike. Okay, that's the point. They all left from Rathmelschike. Edgebert never left. He was told not to leave. He never went back to Britain because he had vowed he never would. <laughs> but that didn't prevent him from suggesting that one of his community, Wichtbert, maybe give it a go. And Wichtbert did. And it's almost certainly Wichtbert who brought with him that 19 year Easter table that I told you about, the one you saw on the, the illustration. 684 to 702. It was almost certainly in or around 684 that Wichtbert took himself to the continent. And that, of course, is the reason why that table came back, why it wasn't abandoned, why it wasn't thrown on the rubbish tip uh, on the continent. Because if Wichtbert left, if he went in 684 and only made it for two or thereabouts years, the table was still valid for 13 or 14 or more years. And so he brought it back with him. And that's why it was in the luggage, as it were, what we call the luggage, the manuscripts, the baggage that our friend Willebrod took with him in 690, the same Easter table, plus follow up Easter tables, which were then required for that mission in subsequent years and decades. OK, so uh, there is a lot happening in Rathmelschige and Edgebert is at the center of all of this, despite the fact that he's never made it back to England. Uh, he must have been in Ireland before the plague, obviously in 664. When he came to Ireland, I don't know. My own suspicion is that um, Rathmelschige was founded or at least had its first uh, influx, let's say, of Anglo-Saxon or Northumbrian monks around about 651 or thereabouts. I think it's to be associated with the, the assassination, the murder of uh, a Northumbrian King Oswina, uh, who was murdered by King Oswald, one of the two uh, Northumbrian princes who had spent some time on the island of Iona, who came back to Northumbria, who succeeded in regaining the throne, Oswiu first and then Oswald. But Oswald Bede has very, very interesting things to say about Oswald and his relationship with Oswina. And it's almost certainly the case that Oswina was murdered uh, at the behest of Oswald. I think it's in the circumstances of that particular uh, affair, if you like, that a lot of the Anglo-Saxon nobility that we're talking about here, a lot of the, the discard or collateral branches of Northumbrian royalty um, that you find popping up in Bede's narrative, that they get the next available flight and they end up in Ireland uh, for good or bad. Okay? But even then, despite the fact that um, Edgebert is resident in Ireland, never went back to 
Britain, never went back to his native Anglo-Saxon Northumbria. So for the best part of 50 years or more, he was an exile from his homeland. We do have a very interesting reference in another text, not in Bede. There is a text um, by a man called Athelwolf, De Abatibus, concerning the abbots. It's a very, very interesting metrical history about a rather obscure Northumbrian church founded probably around the period 705 or thereabouts. We're not altogether sure. The text, as we have it, is slightly later, but it seems to refer to events in the first decade or so of the 8th century. Um, and it describes the circumstances in which this particular monastery was founded. Its founder was a man called Eanmund, who may or may not be connected with some of the people we're talking about. Um, but you are told quite explicitly that Eanmund referred to Egbert for advice on where to establish the monastery, how to establish it, what to do in it, all the various things, all the essentials, if you like, of the initial monastic community. We don't know where it was. I think Craig has been associated with it but I don't think it's uh, known for certain. It doesn't particularly matter. The fact is that Eanmund is clearly in contact with Egbert, even though Egbert hasn't been back in Northumbria for 50 or more years, okay? Somebody has such a strong connection with Egbert that they regard him as the most obvious choice, not the uh, Bishop of Lindisfarne, say, or any of the other um, upper uh, hierarchy, if you like, of the Anglo-Saxon or Northumbrian church. He, he addresses himself to Edgeworth for all this kind of advice. And in a very interesting passage in the De Abatibus, you have this um, sequence, the fame of the cell, break, if that's where it was, the fame of the cell impelled many to enter the perfect monastic life, which the venerable Eanmund adorned by his admirable behavior. Altan was one of them, a man called by a famous name. He was a blessed priest of the Irish race. You could have guessed from the name. We didn't have to be told, okay, Old Tom is an Irishman. Um, it's not uncommon as an Irish name in our period. He was a blessed priest of the Irish race and he could ornament books with fair marking. And by this art, he made the shape of the letters beautiful one by one so that no one modern scribe could equal him. You could be listening to a description of the scribe or scribes of the Book of Kells or the Lindisfarne Gospels or this manuscript. This is <clears throat> one of the most famous of the early Anglo-Saxon manuscripts to come down to us, Durham. There are a number of wonderful manuscripts in the Cathedral Library in Durham, uh, an older gospel book, Durham 8 to 10, and this one, which sadly survives only in fragmentary form. Um, I forget how many pages have survived now. Um, but in its better days, it must have been a rival to Kellogg's. I'm, sh I'm showing a page here, a script page, because the script is interesting. OK, apart from the decoration, it, it's an interesting manuscript in terms of the surviving decoration. You could just about see showing through from the other side uh, a monogram page. But for some reason, my PowerPoint didn't yeah. want you to see this monogram page. I tried to put it in and, uh, and it rejected it. So I had to fall back and show you this substitute page, but you, I think you can get an idea, and this page doesn't do it justice, believe me, the original is absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. Um, it's a fabulous manuscript for all kinds of reasons, beautifully executed in script and decoration and all those things that we associate with the best of insular decorated gospel books from our period. This is another page, um, you get different colors because the thing has been badly damaged in the passage of time, so don't take it at face value, but this is a, a nice example of where you have lesser decoration, so to speak, but still very elaborate, very, very interesting and very um, impressive decoration. Uh, the De Johanne. If you look at the way that the D, the initial D is decorated internally, see the red dotting around it, see the um, enlargement of the, the D itself into an animal head and so on, and the elaboration of the animal's tongue and the red dotting, and that's absolutely magical stuff. It's amazing. Um, badly damaged, unfortunately, over the years and, and, and looks the worst for wear. But, you know, when it was produced initially, it must have been a very, very striking manuscript. Occasionally, um, Some people might say it has to do with whether or not I've taken my pills. Occasionally, I have flights of fancy about Durham 8217 and Ulton and the scribes and so on. If, if you take Ethelwolf at face value, then there clearly was a Rasmelschige trained scribe called Ulton, who was as good as anybody else and maybe better than most, if you believe Ethelwolf at the writing or decoration. Scholars nowadays are inclined to sort of be hesitant as to whether the description actually relates to 
abilities in, in the artistic element of the manuscript or whether we're just talking about the script, just talking about the letters. I, I happen to believe it applies equally to both, but you pay some money and you take your choice. But in this case, as I say, from time to time, I have a sort of flight of fancy and I wonder if in the Book of Kells we're not actually being given a picture of Edgeford. The gentleman you see there on the left, OK, underneath the opening of this book, this is the opening of Matthew, Liber Autum Generationis. Liber is book. book. Our friend has a book in his hands. He's a very fancily got up individual. I don't know whether he has a Germanic hair. Is that pushing things? I, I should have taken the pill after all. But in this case, there is something going on. There's some kind of Jen Jennifer would have told us, I suppose, better than I can, what's going on here. Um, are we being told something here? Are we being told that somebody brought a manuscript to Iona and presented it to the community? Because we do know that in the year 715, Edgbert did leave Rathmelchen. Now, he didn't go back to his native England because he had vowed he never would. Okay, He took himself to Iona. Now, why is anybody's guess? Okay, It may have to do with this kind of activity. It may have to do with the Easter controversy because as it happens, and it's more than as it happens for reasons I can't go into here, in the following year, 716, Iona changed its Easter practice. Iona, which for so long had resisted the uptake of the standard Dionysiac Orthodox 19-year Easter table, the kind of Easter table that we saw there from Ras Melchige in Willebrod's calendar. In 716, the community of Iona did actually decide to make that change. Why? Because a new cycle was beginning in the 84-year cycle and even to the less intellectually endowed, let's say, it must have seemed pretty clear that the problems that were to be encountered in the 84-year table were insurmountable, and that time had come to make the change to the more reliable 19-year institute. This change is attributed in eye resources to Edgbert. As we saw, Edgbert in Rathmelchigan used a 19-year Easter table, had always used a 19-year Easter table, and probably was in a position to explain why it was best to use an Easter table. It's a complicated thing. I won't take you through it, um, but take my word for it. It has been pointed out that the Gospel of John, okay, the Gospel of John in the Book of Kells is identical to the Gospel of John in Durham A217. Now, for anybody who's spent any time with manuscript studies, biblical or otherwise, will know that identity of text is very important. We're talking pre-Xeroxes here now and pre-PDFs, okay? This is somebody copying a text absolutely exactly. It is the same text. The text of John's Gospel in Durham A217 is the same as the text of John's Gospel in Celts. Now, the other Gospels aren't the same, so riddle me that. I, I can't get my head around that. Why one set of Gospels is identical, but not the others. But of course, the Gospel of John had a special place in the Irish psyche for reasons I needn't go into here. John is particularly revered of the Irish in the early Christian period, and that reverence survives all the way down through the medieval period. Owen Brynner, John is re referred to, he has an Irish name, he's given an Irish nickname, the ultimate accolade, if you like, in the Irish context. Owen Brynner, John of the Breast, because he was the John who laid his head on Christ's breast at the Last Supper. He was the closest to the great man himself. And therefore the Irish, some people would say the Celtic churches, whatever that means, but certainly the Irish church reserved a special place for the Gospel of John in our period. And that may well be reflected in the way that the Gospel of John is reproduced in these illuminated Gospel manuscripts. Is that Egbert or Edgbert presenting Durham A217 to the community of Iona? And the lads in Iona say, well, no, we can do better than that. We can produce the Book of Kells and hey, Bresta, um, they have trumped Durham A217, who's to say? Um, I'm being slightly facetious here, but only slightly. Um, I, mo I mentioned a moment ago Owen Brenner, okay, and, and his Irish sobriquet, Owen Brenner, John of the Breast. It is the ultimate accolade, I suppose, in the Irish context that a foreigner be given 
an Irish name. And that's exactly what Edgbert was given by the Irish. What you're looking at here is a very interesting continental text, um, which I'd love to take you through in detail because it has a lot of interesting things to say about uh, Irishmen and the memory of Irishmen on the continent in our period. But I've underlined at the bottom the one that I want you to pay particular attention to, namely 729, Mach Flaha Mortuus. Mach Flaha. Now, Edgbert is the first person mentioned in all the Irish annals for 729. Okay, and everything else that happened in that year comes after the notification of Edgbert's death. I think this is a notification transmitted from an Irish source to the annals of Lorsch, the annals of Lorschimensis, in which you have the recognition of Edgbert's adoption, as it were, as a pure-born Irishman. This man has the ultimate accolade, the mock flaw mortuous. He has died, and we know that he did die in 729. Not only that, how do we know it? We know it for two reasons. We're told by the Irish annals that he died in 729, and we're told by Bede that he died in 729 on the 24th of April, immediately after having celebrated Easter Sunday Mass. And Bede goes on to say this is particularly important because in 729, Easter Sunday was celebrated on a day that had never previously been celebrated on Iona. This was the new dispensation being manifested in the person of the man who had introduced the new dispensation. Bede knew the date precisely. Yeah? You might say, yeah, OK, here's an old dotherer at 90 who's wheeled out to celebrate Easter Mass uh, in 729, and he happens to celebrate it on a date which is significant and so on. Well, you can decide for yourselves. I don't know. Are these things possible? Um, we can't be ageist. Uh, we have to acknowledge that these things are at least feasible or conceivable or whatever the case may be. So where does that leave us with our friend Edgbert? He's everywhere, OK? You cannot avoid him. He's all over Bede's history. He's all over Irish sources. Um, he's significant in the conversion, as Bede would say, of the Irish community from their old ways, from their heterodox ways. Some people would have said from their heretical ways as regards Easter and so on. Um, at the centre of all that activity is Edgbert. And here I'm back to where I almost began or where we've been before. This is the Moore Memorandum that we saw previously. Um, in this case, you're looking at the page immediately before the one I showed you before. And here you can see the expertise. This is the end of Bede's history, okay? Expertit, Domino. Domino Juvante, Expertit Domino Juvante. Liber Quinto Historiae Ecclesiastice Gente and Glorum. Here, with the, the help of God, ends the fifth book, the last book of Bede's history on the English race, okay? The Historia Ecclesiastica. Now, you can see that there are actually two additional entries, okay? This is interesting. I don't have time to enter the details of it, but there is always the question of a first recension of a text and a second recension of a text, or maybe a third or fourth or whatever the case may be. Um, Bede, remember, died in 731, or rather 735. Um, he wrote his history, or at least he signed off on his history, let's put it that way, in 731. There is evidence that it's added to. There is a so-called continuatio, a continuation of Bede. This is part of the evidence for that. Here at the bottom of the page, you can see in the same handwriting. That's what's interesting here. OK, this is exactly the same handwriting. Or if it isn't, it's as near as makes no difference. It's certainly out of the same scriptorium. These are a number of additional references that somebody decided were worth adding in in relation to what Bede had just told you in the ecclesiastical history. And this leads us again on the, the, the flip of the page. Once you turn the page, once you get to 128 versa, this is what you get. Interestingly enough, at the top of the page, you get the text of the Cadvon's Hymn, the famous Cadvon Hymn, uh, one of the earliest monuments of Anglo-Saxon literature, much, much beloved of our colleagues across the water. And this is almost certainly the closest version to the original. It's in the Northumbrian dialect, I'm assured. I'm not an Anglo-Saxon or English scholar, um, but it's, it appears to be uh, the closest version to what was in circulation in Bede's time. And then you have immediately after that, starting here, you have a list of kings, OK? And these are the kings of Northumbria, OK? Anno, DCL, that's to say 547, Ida, Ida Regnare Quepit, 
king called Ida began to reign. Aquo regalis nordan himbrorum sapia origines. They, from, from whom the royal race of Northumbria takes its origin, okay? And then you get a list of all the kings that followed Ida, okay? Including all the kings we've been talking about. You have Oswald there in the middle. You have Oswiu, who reigned for 28 years. You have Edgerith, our friend Edgerith, who's given a, a regnal period of 15 years. Edgerith, I should have pointed out to you, of course, um, when I showed you that dedication page, that dedication stone, rather, from Jarrow from the 23rd of April in uh, 684, 685. Um, within a month of that dedication, Edfric was dead at the head of an army that he had led into the Pictish kingdoms. He was ambushed and he and the flower of his army were wiped out. Bede is very interesting on the subject and, and who was to succeed him and who knew about him and who his relations were and all that kind of thing. But Edfrith is slap bang there in the middle. But Edfrith is also well known, both from Bede, but also from Irish sources, because in the year previously, in 684, he had actually instituted a murderous attack on this country. In 684, an Anglo-Saxon, a Northumbrian army, came and attacked the area known as Brecha. Um, Coast, coastal Meath, so to speak, uh, in the course of which many people were killed, many churches were devastated, and many prisoners were taken away into captivity, according to Bede. It's the only occasion when Bede says that Edgefrit's demise the following year served him bloody well right. And he said because he'd been cursed by the Irish on foot of this attack on them in 684, this unprovoked attack. And B says, although you're not supposed to curse, and we don't recommend it, in this case, he deserved all the curses he got. <laughs> and he got the comeuppance that he deserved because he had attacked the poor, innocent uh, Irish. <laughs> yes, now why Edgefrit attacked Ireland in 684? Don't get me started, okay? We've only so many hours in the day. But all of these things are part and parcel of the story that we're talking about. And remember that Edgefrith was related to most of the other people that I had mentioned to. He almost certainly was the brother of our Edgebert. Almost certainly. He certainly was the brother. The, the relationship is, is slightly dubious in Bede's words. Uh, notice, strata notice. He almost certainly was a brother of Aldfrith. who succeeded him in circumstances that Bede is very, very interesting about, but I don't have time to tell you. Okay, they're all related. Okay, we're talking here about regime change. What happens when somebody falls off a horse? What happens when somebody decides to take on the picts and comes out the worst for it? What happens when somebody gets a knife in his gut? What happens when one of these people finally ends their days as king? The circumstances afterwards are very, very interesting. They're described by Ethelwolf in similar circumstances in the day of Atibus. They're described in the anonymous lives of the Wearmouth Jarrow Abbots. They're described in all kinds of contemporary sources. We need to keep it in our, our uh, minds that there's always something going on in the background, okay? Something clearly is happening uh, in all these cases. So from that point of view, it's interesting that again, according to Bede, Edgbert, remember, Edgbert of Rathmelchiga, who hadn't been in his native Northumbria for the best part of 60 years, mm -hmm. is reported by Bede to have said to Edgbert not to attack the Picts. He warned him not to attack the Picts. Now you might say, how the hell did he know in Rathmelchiga? that Etrius was planning a campaign against the Picts, but that's a whole different ballgame. The point is, you are told that Etrius, the gun-toting, so to speak, the trigger-happy uh, side of the family, decided to have a go at the Picts, just as he had had in the year previously against the Irish, and Edgebert advised him against it. Okay? He ignored the evidence, and look what happened. Okay? But the question is, how could Edgebert be in a position to advise such a thing, given his location and given the fact that he's been in permanent exile 
for 50 or more years. OK, so Edgebert clearly is the center of all these activities. Um, and the proof, I think, finally, and I let you go after this, um, is that final passage there that you're looking at in the Moore Memorandum, Pater Edgebert, OK? The whole text is the consummation of Bede's history, OK? This is the stamp, as it were, at the end, the imprimatur, the nihil obstat, if you like, at the end of Bede's history. What is this all about? It's about the advent of Saxonum, which you have at the end of the Moore Memorandum. It's about the kings of Northumbria. It's about the succession of the kings of Northumbria one to each other and the circumstances in which they do so. And it's about the monastery of Wearmouth. And above all, it's about Pater Edgebert, who's there literally in the centre of the page. The man who occupies the central position in the final sentence in the last element of Bede's history. Pater Edgebert transceived it at Christum in 729, because as far as Bede is concerned, that is the end of Northumbrian history. Thank you. And your students are so lucky. <laughs> and I remember also what you said about Egbert running through everything. One of the exercises that Jennifer set us as, as undergraduates was to watch out for him <laughs> in the ecclesiastical history and, and literally map him and map people he knew. And what came across so forcefully from what you were saying was the, inter the interconnectedness of these islands and the extraordinary presence of Irish people in an ecclesiastical history of the English people and of the English presence here. And if you ever want another career as a tour guide, <laughs> it was beautifully done and so learned, but learning worn so lightly. And when you were speaking, you showed a wonderful photograph of the High Cross, and that's on a brochure which has been distributed. And Tom O'Reilly has overseen the publication of the pamphlets as they are coming out. And they are available on sale after mass here at 250. Yeah. So what we will do now is if I'm sure Dobby will be willing to listen and answer any questions over a glass or two of wine, but we will adjourn outside and first thank them for a superb paper and so enjoyable.